Um, I'm Barbara Burgo, as some of you already know, and um, I have been working long and hard for many years to try to get something going here on Cape Cod as a um, as an initiative and a nonprofit, which we are now calling the Cape Cod Cape Verdean Museum and Cultural Center. Um, I didn't do enough programs, but anyone that wants one can get one. And the traffic already has started. I come from Brewster. And so I left an hour early, and I got here just in time to print these at stable, just five or six of them, and I said, I got to run. Everyone was waiting for me. So I just did those, and anyone can take a look, a um, few, just so that we could follow along so that the, the professor could take one back for his records to show Rhode Island College that he did, and David Vieira will be able to have one for his offices, and um, we'll know where to, where, where to follow along. Um, what happened is, Unfortunately, I had done this like late last night. Wesley Late, our president, uh, president of the Cape Cod, Cape Cod Cape Verdean Museum and Cultural Center, had to work today. He owns his own business, and he's fixing a, a, a Creole's house in Wareham. So we love him. We will we will touch with him. And actually, the house is the, fa the father of Dr. Amina Pilgrim. Many of you met her last year for the. Um, the um, Frederick Douglass event, and so we thank him. He was trying to get done in time for today to be here, and he could not be. So um, unless he runs in last minute, I will fill in. Um, we have another board member, Trish Oshman, Patricia Oshman. You folks know her as the Falmouth, the co-chair of the Falmouth uh, Affirmative Action and Diversity Committee. She. Um, she heard about this, loves this. We call it, of course, not just Cape Cod, Cape Verdeans, not just Cape Verdeans, but we are part of the local Lusophone um, population, which of course means we, 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 our culture, our heritage was all speaking Portuguese, and I, Peter speaks Portuguese much better than I do. And um, so this is what we're going to try to enhance, not just the Cape Verdeans here, but the entire Lusophone community and those that touch us. And that means the Wampanoags and the immigrants that have come along the way and the people that helped uh, us get this, this land started. It's exciting. So um, without further ado, one of the others uh, who helped us coordinate this and did some tweaking on the computers and did a lot of advertising on her website. She was wonderful enough to say, I would love to collaborate with you. And she's done a few nice collaborative things. And this is Deb Berglund, you're a director? Director of the um, Boston University School of Social Work at Four Seas. And I'm gonna welcome up Deb so, as a wonderful thank you for collaboration and um, tell us just a little bit about what you're doing and why this is important to you, and then she can introduce the Hi. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Deb Berglund. I'm the director of the Cape Cod campus for Boston University School of Social Work. A lot of people don't even know that we're there, but um, we're at uh, Four Cs. We do a master's in clinical social work program there. Um, we've been there for almost 20 years and have graduated about 125 social workers from our program. The motto of the off-campus programs is educating social workers in the community for the community. And um, one of the things that I love about being part of this program is that I can use my, I live here in Falmouth, so I can use my position to do collaborations with community partners, not just to provide internships for our students, but also to provide education for our students and the community. And um, I have a big belief in not just educating social workers in the community, but having the community educate the social workers um, to, to serve the community. And um, I love our lecturers um, that come down from Boston but I love our community members more who come and talk to our students about lived experience um, because I think that is so important for our students to understand if they are going to serve members of our community. Um, so some of the things that we have done recently is um, we had members of the tribe uh, come and talk with our students and do a community presentation. We've 
Kristen St. Ange, who is a uh, woman of Cape Verdean descent who also is from Falmouth um, and a BUSSW alum who talk with our students about um, Cape Verde culture and history. We've had Rafaela Almeida, who is a Brazilian uh, woman in here in Falmouth, who's also an alum of ours, come talk to us about Brazilian culture and health issues within the community. Uh, we most recently paired with Zion Heritage Museum for a showing of Into the Light and a panel discussion with dominant um, ethnic cultures here on the Cape. And upcoming, we have another movie showing at Four Seas and a panel discussion with immigrants to Cape Cod about the contribution that immigrants make here on Cape Cod. So when I was at an Affirmative Action Diversity Committee meeting with Trish, actually, um, here in Falmouth a couple of months ago, and Barbara came and talked about this. Um, I was thrilled to, to offer to be part of it and honored that she allowed us to be. Um, so I am happy to be here. I am happy to be a learner in this environment. Um, and um, again, honored to be able to partner Thank with you. you. What, before she introduces the state rep, while I'm thinking of it. I travel all over Cape Cod, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, wherever I have to go, to learn more about what we need to learn more about. And one of the things, talking about the social work, I went last um, two weeks ago to Boston, to, to Roxburgh, um, Dorchester area. And why I went was because here's one of the most critical things. When she Partnered. I just said to David and, and, and Peter, you know, this is like the stars are all aligning. What they were having at the library in a room this size that was standing room only and people standing outside to listen, they had for Black History Month um, mental illness while black. Hmm. I believe that's how they put it. Mental illness while black. And the reason that so impresses me that I think it's way past time that if you folks could think of collaborating with a conference like that, it's because there certainly are many, many blacks, browns, Cape Verdeans, Latinos, Latinx, African Americans that have a unique hidden story to know. And those hidden stories came out in powerful ways from powerful social workers, PhD, uh, P, um, PhDs, uh, social, um, just directors in the community. And there were tears and there were jeers in the room. I'd asked them, could they come down here? I personally talk about it all the time. I have had two brothers who commit suicide. I'm writing a book. My first brother, it was when we were younger, in the 60s and 50s, I looked like this, an Angela Davis wannabe, and he looked very Portuguese. And the idea was for them to pass. And I'm still, we are all still dealing with this today, not just the way that society treats us all differently based on phenotype but the way we treat our own differently. And I know that was the problem with my brother because the day he first attempted suicide, he came to my bedside and I was 16 years old and he asked, could I ever forgive him for not talking to me for two years in high school because he couldn't identify me as his sister. So that's for another day, that's for another time, but I know Peter will agree with me and the folks in this room, the stigma on such things is so great that my brother's been gone 45 years and we still can't talk about it. So I would hope someday you'd think of a collaboration like that and I'd be willing to, even though we still have a hard time talking about it, we must. I thank you for what you're doing. It's, it's ironic you bring that up because my first job um, out of social work school was in Dorchester at the Community Health Center. I was the only Caucasian person in the entire agency. And, um, and you know, all cultures have, have issues that are unique to them. Um, but 
we all have universal issues um, that affect us as well. And, and some of the other trainings that we've done, similar to what you're talking about, is, is we had a training on um, PTSD among veterans. And we had a panel of World War II veterans all the way up to active um, duty folks speak about their experiences. And the same thing with the LGBTQ community, from teenagers to elders talking about their experiences. And I would love to do a collaboration with you. Because we had the PTSD before they labeled it PTSD, and they just said right. another crazy kid commits suicide. That's right. And that's not. That's right. Thank you. So I'm also here to introduce David Vieira. David is a, a townie in the best sense of the word here in Falmouth. Uh, born and raised here, a state representative since 2010. Um, and uh, Town meeting moderator since 1998. I don't even know if you're old enough to have done that since that <laughs> <laughs> um, David, is, do any of you remember Where's Waldo? <laughs> now it's a giant picture with a tiny little guy that you have to sign. David is like a whole picture of David with nothing else in it because David is everywhere. I don't know how you do that, but he seems to be wherever you are. Um, which is kind of what we want to see in our state representatives. We want them to be here in the community and interacting with the people. So since beginning his career, he's volunteered, been a leader, and, um, and received awards for his efforts to help children, families, elders, veterans, victims of natural disasters, businesses, and people of all cultures. He is uh, the parliamentarian for the Portuguese American Association of Falmouth and also a member of the Portuguese American Legislative Caucus of Massachusetts. Um, in 2018, I understand he met Barbara at a Cape Verdean cultural festival and offered to help her find a place to house the Cape Cod Cape Verdean Museum and Cultural Center. And lucky us that he lives here because this is where he's looking. Um, for a place for this, and um, it it will be thrilling to have this museum housed here. I'm sorry you're going to have to come from Brewster every day to work at it, but maybe you'll enough. have to move here too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so because of, at least in part because of David's involvement, that's why this event is here today, because Barbara is here today. So, David. Thank you, Deb. So, I took a class called City Inside a Monument when I was at American University of Washington DC. And Professor Edward Smith, who was a assistant to President Carter, uh, and an African-American who grew up in the DuPont Circle area uh, of Washington, DC, ended the story of the class that if you remember nothing else from this class, I want you to remember that your job is to now go out and understand that everyone has a story to tell and every place has a story to tell. And your job is to help tell those stories. And that stuck with me. It, it stuck with me as a, as a Portuguese American that when I came back to Falmouth uh, at 21 years old, joined the Falmouth Historical Society and made sure that uh, we had the Portuguese American voice at the society here museums on the green and that we had collections and exhibits and started telling more of that story. Um, but then as that story became more told, my desire to help others tell stories really took root. And so when I was asked by Wesley a number of years ago to, to come down to the Cape Verdean Association and to go to, the, go to the festival and to hear and see some of those stories, we began working together to try to tell some more stories and tell the stories of the Cape Verdean population in Falmouth, uh, here, the history of Falmouth, but also the history of Cape Verde itself. Uh, and a pivotal day for me was uh, walking through Stop and Shop one day when a member of the Cape Verdean community came up to me. And he entered and said, what are you doing for the Cape Verdeans in Tintin? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, what do we even do? You guys got that thing in the Village Green down there in front of the, the tea ticket school, and what are we doing? And so, so we joked about that a little bit, and, 
and talk about it. And, and so that was really uh, another uh, impetus to make sure that we work together, that we work together. And, and Wayne, who's behind the camera today, who, uh, Wayne, congratulations. Wayne was just recognized uh, on uh, Beacon Hill uh, this month um, for black excellence in Massachusetts. Uh, the oh. Wayne, congratulations. But Wayne told me when we started uh, having dinner to, to talk about working with the museum about how the story might get difficult to tell, right? The story might be difficult to tell if we actually tell the story, right? Because, you know, most of my family came from Portugal, some from the mainland, some from the Azores, and we were telling those stories. Turnip farms, and we had strawberry farms, so we worked on the cranberry bogs. But we also had a series of colonies in the Portuguese Empire. Now, while we want to talk about Guilmage and Cabo de Bujador and how we broke the barrier of the flat world and circumnavigated, and we taught Christopher Columbus how to sail, we also enslaved. It became part of a trading industry that enslaved Africans. The South, Cap Verde, and all over the continent of Africa. And we moved that trade to the triangles of the Caribbean. And so it's a tough story to tell. I'm a proud Portuguese American. But I also know that I live among many proud African Americans. Cape Verdean Americans who have a much different story in the history of their relationship with the United States and their relationship with them. And so today it's exciting for me to be able to introduce a leading scholar that tells the story of the move of independence for Guinea-Bissau and for Cap Verde so that as we move forward in this country, we understand the history and the foundations of where all of us in the community came from, and then we can be inspired to work together to move forward to how we together take those words that were in our Declaration of Independence, which was narrowly interpreted, but broadly aspirational, to make sure that all men and all races and colors and religions are created equal, and that they all have a seat at the table of American democracy. And so today we're going to hear about that history. We're going to hear about the latest uh, story of uh, Amilcar Gabral, the founder of the liberation movement uh, of both Guinea-Bissau and of Cap Verde by Professor Mende, who's a professor of history and Africana studies at Rhode Island College with a doctorate in political science and West African studies from the University of Birmingham in England. He has numerous publications on the colonial and post-colonial history and politics of Guinea-Bissau, including two volumes of the Historical Dictionary of the Republic of Guinea-Bissau with co-author Richard Lohman, who we've met uh, here at a few events as well. Professor Mende was director of Guinea-Bissau's leading social science research institute, the Instituto Nacional de Estudios e Pesquisa, Pesquisa, the National Institute of Studies and Research, from 1994 to 1998, having served as deputy director since 1991. He's also worked in Senegal as consultant for the United Nations African Institute for Economic Development and Planning, and in Angola as the policy advisor for the United Nations Development Program, Angola also being a former uh, colony of Portugal. Professor Mende is currently a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Leadership and Management, as well as a member of the Academic Advisory Council of the Institute for Portuguese and Lusophone World Studies at Rhode Island College. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce to you Professor Mende. Uh, Representative Vieira, uh, special thank you to my sister Darla. We've known each other for a long time since uh, the college days in uh, 
down at the college. I am really, truly uh, honored to be here to share this, uh, what I would call, uh, commemoration of one of the greatest um, men in history. Um, I have my little share of the connection with uh, Dorchester. <laughs> uh, when I first came here, I lived in Dorchester. And I taught at schools in Dorchester. I taught at the Dearborn, the Phyllis Wheatley, uh, and I ended up at Woodrow Wilson. So I, I, I lived in Dorchester for a while. And as I said, when I first came here, Boston <coughs> University was uh, the library was what I used to finish my dissertation. So, um, uh, I'm Ilka Cabral. This book uh, that was recently published in, uh, last year is a contribution to uh, Ohio University Press's, um, they have a series called African Leaders of the 20th Century. The series aims to introduce uh, African leaders to undergraduates, uh, but as well as the, uh, the general public, but particularly college students. Uh, and is to also bring a balance because our perception of Africa is, I always tell my students, we have this, the triple D perception of Africa, death, design, disaster, and devastation. That's the only news you get out of Africa. Nothing, nothing worth, uh, of value comes out of Africa. So, um, Amilcar Cabral was that post-independence generation um, that visionary had a clear idea of what societies they wanted to create and so it was they were nationalist passionately nationalist but also pan-africanist in the sense that they had uh, ideas of uniting the continent in spite of its great diversity of culture and ethnicity you know, and, um, and races and all different uh, shades. Uh, Africans, by the way, are the most diverse people <coughs> in the world. It is the second largest continent, but it has the most diverse people. And yeah, I know all black people look alike, but they are very diverse. <laughs> and, yeah. um, so, uh, people like uh, Kwame Nkrumah and Patrice Lumumba and Julius Nyerere, these are names that you hear all the time when, whenever you talk about great African leaders. Uh, but Amilcar Cabral is not only among the great African leaders of the 20th century, he was recently uh, recognized by a panel of historians that listed him among 20 of the greatest, greatest leaders in the world period in world history. This is a BBC uh, list. It had yet to be approved, but he is on that list. And he is among people like great pharaohs and great European monarchs and um, statesmen and Asian monarchs and statesmen, but also including uh, more recent leaders like Abraham Lincoln of the United States and British uh, Prime Minister Winston Churchill. So that is a great achievement, and if you're Cambodian, you should be proud. Uh, if you're African, you should be proud, because he is uh, one of three Africans that made that list. The great um, Amenhotep of uh, the, the Pharaoh of Egypt, uh, the great Mansa Musa of the Mali Empire, and Amilcar Cabral. Those are the three Africans that made that list. So. Um, Focus on leadership in Africa is very important. Uh, it is obvious that uh, the crisis of leadership in Africa since independence is there for everybody to see. Uh, this crisis manifests itself in the instability, the conflicts, the genocide, and acts of genocide. Uh, and so focusing on leadership is part of the answer. It is a crisis of leadership that is the most, I would say, the most serious crisis 
in Africa. Amelga Cabral actually described himself as a simple African. That was perhaps the world's greatest understatement. Because Cabral was nothing but simple. He was an accomplished agronomist. He was, uh, when he finished his studies in Portugal, he was um, employed by the colonial state in Portuguese, what was then called Portuguese Guinea. And he conducted the very first uh, agricultural survey and census, not only in Guinea-Bissau, but in the whole of the Portuguese Empire. He was the very first. And by the way, he was the very first African agronomist, uh, for that matter. So I write this bi biography uh, beginning with, a, with an account of Cabral's life. Cabral, so this is the book, maybe I should give this a little bit, so we can, is that better? So I, I start this uh, biography by um, looking at the place where it all started. It all started in a tiny Portuguese outpost in, uh, in West Africa called Guinea Portuguesa, Portuguese Guinea. The Portuguese, as we know, were the first European in modern times. They were the first Europeans in Africa. And they started their voyages of exploration uh, in the early 1400s. Uh, they would come down the West African coast. Of course, their destination was not Africa. Their destination was India. They were trying to get to India and China because that's where the trade was. Portugal, having uh, freed herself from almost 700 years of domination by the Muslims, is not only uh, political in the, politically independent, but Portugal wanted to be economically independent. They didn't want to be dependent on Muslim traders, so they had to get to the trade. The trade, as today, was in the east, so uh, they couldn't send their, they couldn't go overland to India and China as the. Italians have been doing. You guys remember Marco, uh, Marco Polo and his uncles, all that uh, uh, trade that were, they were bringing into Europe. They couldn't do that because the trade routes to the east was blocked by, um, was controlled by Muslim uh, armies. So the only choice they had was to round Africa, to go by sea. And they would make history because those seas were never uh, sailed. So they started off with these rickety boats called caravellas, and they would inch their way to a certain point and then return back to Portugal and analyze the data and then move on beyond the point that they had stopped the last time. And so uh, they would keep doing that until about 18, 1487 or so. Um, they would reach the very bottom of Africa and they would call that point in what is today Southern Africa, Cabo de Boa Esperanza, the Cape of Good Hope, because they were now very hope hopeful of getting to their final destination, which is India. Meanwhile, uh, and of course the famous Vasco da Gama would take the Portuguese to India. Meanwhile, before that happens, uh, as they are moving south, they would accidentally stumble onto islands like the Madeira Islands, the Canary Islands, the Azores, and of course, famously, the Cape Verde Islands. The Cape Verde Islands uh, would be reached in 1456, and the Portuguese, when they find these islands, as far as we know, um, as far as the uh, record shows, they were uninhabited islands. So the Portuguese would quickly settle these islands with uh, settlers from Portugal, sometimes Spaniards and Italians would also be among the settlers. 
And uh, in the case of Cape Verde, the um, islands were quickly settled, and the crown gave the settlers the right to own slaves, and also to trade in slaves. So the adjacent islands, the adjacent islands would be, the adjacent mainland, I should say, would be quickly, uh, uh, would be the, the area of activity of the settlers. The settlers would be going onto the mainland to, um, to, uh, to find captives that they would take onto the islands and enslave. And so you would have the first slave plantation society in the tropics would be on Cape Verde. So Cape Verde would be the model. As they move south as well, they would settle on islands like San Tome and Princip, and they would start a slave plantation society. It is that model, the plantation society, that was established in Cape Verde and on San Tome and Princip that would be exported later to the Americas. So Cape Verde plays a very important role. So African captives are taken from the mainland and they are enslaved on Cape Verde and it is the interaction between the African captives and the Portuguese that would create this mixed race society that we know that is today of Cape Verde. That is the background uh, uh, of uh, Amilcar Cabral's uh, uh, heritage. That is Amilcar Cabral's heritage. So Amilcar Cabral was born in Guinea-Bissau, then called Portuguese Guinea. Exactly, he was born in the town of Bafata, here in the interior of the country. <coughs> now at this time, this was in 1924, 12th September 1924, he was born here. At the time, um, the mainland, uh, this territory has a mainland and archipelago. It's the only country in West Africa which has a mainland and archipelago. This archipelago has 88 islands. Only the main ones are shown here. When he was born, this mainland was, uh, had been conquered nine years previously. It was conquered in 1915. It was born in 1924. So it was recently conquered. The Portuguese were busy consolidating their control of this. So that's a context. That context is very important. By the time he would leave, he would leave, I'm sorry. He would leave at age eight, eight years old. When he leaves uh, in 1934, uh, I'll get used to this. When he leaves in 1924, in 1934, um, 1932, he was. Uh, when he leaves this country, this uh, the country has not yet been completely uh, conquered. These islands would not be finally uh, conquered by the Portuguese until 1936. So he would leave two years before that and find himself in Cuba. By the way, this is the house that is still standing. It's today a museum in Bafata. This is the house that Cabral was born in Bafata. So that background is very important. Cabral would leave at age eight to Cape Verde. And in Cape Verde, he would, be, uh, he would go back to the islands to the island of Santiago. These are his parents. His father is Antonio, uh, Juvenal Antonio Lopez da Costa Cabral. The mother is Eva Pinal Evora. So here is a portrait of them, and here's the young Cabral. Um, the islands, as I said, uh, are very strategic. They are 400 miles off the coast, uh, the Senegalese coast. Uh, you can see here on the map. This is the West African coast, so the islands are here. So his parents come from this island of the, the if not the biggest, it's certainly, it's certainly the most dynamic island 
um, on the uh, on the Cape Verdean archipelago. And today, of course, the capital Praia is on this island. So this is where he goes. Uh, his father has a big house in Santa Catalina, Ashada Falcão, and that's where he would uh, uh, spend some time before he moves to Praia, and uh, where he completes his high, his uh, primary education, and then he would go on to the island of San Vincent. So this is the house that he grew up in. It's in Santa Catarina. Uh, the house is still standing. And uh, he would go on to do his high school education in San Vincent. Let me make sure I point out San Vincent. Uh, this island here, it is considered the cultural capital of, of, of Cape Verde. That's where the first um, high school uh, was built. Um, so that's where he would go to finish his high school, and from there he would get a scholarship. Cabral was a very, very smart student. He would come top of his class. From primary school, he was always at the top uh, of his class. And from there, he would go on to Portugal. Uh, and it is in Portugal at the Technical University in Lisbon where he would enroll to start his study uh, his studies in agronomy. He was the, when he enrolled in, uh, in 1945, he was the only black student, not only in his class, but in the whole school. Uh, this was rare. Uh, to, it was rare at the time to have uh, African students in Portugal. But there were a few that were there. Now, 1945 is the end of a world conflict that ended fascism, you know, in uh, in Germany and um, and fascism in in uh, in Italy and uh, Nazism in Germany. But uh, in 1945, a very brutal dictatorship uh, was 15 years old. A dictatorship that started with the overthrow of uh, a liberal, a democratic government uh, that came about after the monarchy was uh, overthrown in 1910. Uh, so this liberal democracy was there in 1926. The military moved in and overthrew it. And they, they, a very brutal dictatorship called the Estado Novo, the new state, uh, was uh, established. So that, again, that context is important. Because Amilcar Cabral, as a student, in Portugal, he's also involved in the anti-dictatorship, anti-fascist movement. So he finds himself fighting um, or in demonstration. It's clandestine because the regime is pretty brutal. But he is one of uh, very few Africans that are involved in the anti-fascist struggle, together with Portuguese uh, progressives, socialists, people like Mario Suarez, that would later become uh, uh, president of uh, of, uh, uh, of a post-fascist uh, 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 Portugal. So um, after his studies in, uh, in Portugal, it is Portugal is very important for, for Amilcar Cabral because in Portugal he would meet with other Africans. Uh, he would learn a lot about the whole Portuguese empire, how Africans are treated in, these empire, in, the, in the rest of the colonies. Cape Verde has a special status under the dictatorship. The dictatorship would declare uh, Cape Verde a civilized colony. The others are non-civilized colonies where the Africans have to acquire the status of civilizado. So everybody in Cape Verde is a civilizado, but in the colonies of Portuguese Guinea, Angola, Mozambique, uh, San Tomé and Princip, they have to work for it. Now, the status of civil, civil, civilizado is acquired first by education. You have to be able to read and write correctly Portuguese. Uh, you have to live the lifestyle of a Portuguese. It also includes having Portuguese names. You know, you cannot be a civilized African if you don't, if you don't call Manuel, Santos, uh, Alvarenga, whatever, the long Portuguese name. That was all part of it. Uh, and that, again, that is important. 
because uh, it is the typical colonial tactic of divide and rule. The fact that the, the Cape Verdeans are all, uh, with one stroke of a pen, they're all civilized. And the, the other uh, fact that Portugal is uh, ruling over a vast empire, Angola itself is at least 20 times bigger than Portugal, there's a man, manpower so, uh, shortage. Portugal is overextended. So um, it would recruit Cape Verdeans. Cape Verde actually would have the highest level of uh, education of all the colonies. In 1950, when uh, a census of the population was taken, the illiteracy rate in Cape Verde was 78%. And if you think that is high, 78%, it was 97% in Mozambique, 98% in Angola and 99% in Guinea-Bissau. So the Cape Verdeans were put in a pretty uh, privileged, relatively privileged position. The Portuguese would recruit Cape Verdeans as colonial officials in Guinea-Bissau. Now, being a colonial official, uh, it's a problem because you are now seen as part of the problem because the colonial policies, the harsh colonial policies are implemented by the colonial officials. In, Cape, in Guinea Bissau, Guinea Bissau is where most of the, the Cape Verdean colonial officials were sent. Some went to Angola, but the majority went to, um, to uh, Portuguese Guinea. Um, there's an estimate of something like 75% of the colonial officials in Portuguese Guinea were Cape Verdean. So that the, the struggle against colonialism, the anger of the colonized against the colonizers, is now directed towards the, towards the Cape Verdean colonial official. In other words, the Cape Verdeans would be synonymous with colonialism. They are seen as co-colonizers, all right? So that the wrath against uh, the colonizers is also directed, in the case of Guinea Bissau, is directed uh, towards, the, um, towards the Cape Verdean. That context is important because to appreciate the remarkable leadership qualities of Cabral, Cabral is a Cape Verdean. He's born in Guinea-Bissau, mother, both mother and father are Cape Verdean. Right. And the fact that when he finishes his studies, he's able to go back to Guinea-Bissau, work for the colonial uh, authorities, and at the same time begins an underground um, tries to uh, start an underground movement to mobilize the Africans, uh, the, the native Guineans, for independence. Again, the context here is decolonization in Africa. After the Second World War, there's a wave of decolonization sweeping across Africa. It would start in North Africa in 1951, the first African country to be decolonized is the Italian colony of Libya. And then very quickly, uh, you would have Morocco, uh, Tunisia, the Sudan, and by the end of the 1950, that wave would cross the Sahara Desert, and now uh, two West African countries would be decolonized. That is, the British colony of the Gold Coast would become Ghana, and then the French colony of French Guinea, there are three Guineas in Africa, there were three Guineas, they still are. Um, there's, there were Portuguese Guinea, which is today Guinea-Bissau, French Guinea, which was the one that became independent in 1958, and it is, its independence is very important for the independence of Portugal, of, of uh, Guinea-Bissau, excuse me, Cape Verde, and the decolonization of the rest of Africa. And you also have Spanish Guinea, which is today called Equatorial Guinea. Um, so uh, that decolonization, uh, wave of decolonization that is happening in Africa. Con some countries like the British, they have accepted the inevitability of decolonization. Decolonization meaning the ending of colonialism. The British uh, being very pragmatic and also having 
the experience of losing the 13 colonies over here, um, they have, it took them some time to come to terms with that, we know that. And then uh, in the 1940s, soon after uh, the Second World War, they would also uh, begin to lose their colonies in Asia, beginning with the jewel in their crown, that's India. They would lose that in 1946, 47. And so they've come to terms with that. They've accepted that decolonization, grudgingly, is inevitable. So we might as well accept it. On the contrary, the Portuguese stubbornly refuse to accept decolonization. They don't even want to contemplate it. And so uh, when you have troublemakers like Amilcar Cabral talking about independence, they are seen as mortal enemies. So the Portuguese would start by saying, I mean, they immediately kick into, I'm going to say the Portuguese, please understand the Portuguese system. Because Amilcar Cabral makes that very, <coughs> that distinction is very, very clear. He would say, you know what, we are not fighting against the Portuguese people. So, identifying the enemy, this is the famous quotation of Amilcar Cabral. He said, our people make a distinction between the fascist colonial uh, government and the people of Portugal. The people that are fighting for the, their independence, they, they are not fighting against the Portuguese people. And Cabral will stand out among African nationalists because the Portuguese soldiers themselves tell us that when they were caught, as they were fighting in Guinea-Bissau, when they were caught by the uh, by, by Amilcar Cabral's liberation movement, the fighters, this movement that he calls the African Party for the Independence of Guinea and Cape Verde. Amilcar Cabral always linked the independence of Guinea-Bissau to Cape Verde, obviously, for obvious reasons. He is of both countries. All right. He was, he's Guinean by birth and Cape Verdean by ancestry. And so being a Pan-African as well, Pan-Africanism is about the liberation of all of Africa. So he has that double com uh, commitment. So um, Cabral made that distinction between um, the people and the enemy. So the, uh, uh, the, the Portuguese um, were very, very, um, uh, uh, full of praise uh, for Amilcar Cabral and how they were treated. Uh, people, when they were caught, they would be sent to. Uh, they would be they would be given uh, to the Red Cross. I mean, it's happened not once. Uh, Portuguese soldiers that were uh, prisoners of war would be returned to the um, to the Red Cross, the uh, International Red Cross, and allowed to go home. So Amilcar Cabral is now waging a war. His liberation movement um, in Guinea-Bissau is, uh, is necessarily uh, an underground movement. The Portuguese don't recognize, don't accept any form of dissent. Um, when a group of workers went on strike in 1959, the authorities came out and in, um, in quelling the, the, um, the strike, over 50 people were killed. That would be the Pinjigiti massacre. And that would be the critical turning point here. Because that signal to Cabral that the Portuguese really don't want to negotiate. Independence for them is not negotiable. But it was, it was also um, fortunate that the country next door, this uh, country that was called French Guinea has now become independent. Uh, it was independent the year before, in 1958. And so Amilcar Cabral will now move his liberation movement next door to Guinea Conakry, and that would be the sanctuary from where the war would be launched. The PAIGC headquarters would be in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Guinea Conakry. So he would be the commander of this movement. Uh, 
here we see him with his uh, fighters in the forest. Amilcar has, uh, has this tremendous energy. He is in the field. He is, he is the commander. He is the diplomat. You know. uh, he's traveling. He is uh, uh, making the case uh, for the war. He is the one that is trying to mobilize resources uh, from the international organizations, from, um, from countries. And at the same time, he's also writing. He's an intellectual. He writes books. He, writes, he, he gives lectures. You know, tremendously en energetic uh, person. He doesn't only, only uh, mobilize men. He also mobilizes women. The liberation movement in Guinea-Bissau have women fighters. They're not in the background cooking and washing. These are people who pick up the gun and they are beside the men fighting. All right? And that they could do that has everything to do with this charismatic uh, leader, Amilcar Cabral. Uh, the, um, Amilcar Cabral has conviction, integrity, and he is real with the people. He tells them, his soldiers, his uh, fighters, hide nothing from the masses of our people. Tell no lies. Expose lies wherever they are told. Claim no, mask no difficulties, mistakes, failures. Claim no easy victory. Victories. So, he is uh, fighting, Amilcar is fighting, unlike the other African nationalists that just struggle for independence, and once they achieve political independence, it's all over. But for Cabral, independence is not just flag independence, it's not just you know, uh, chasing the colonizers out of the country, it is also about um, creating a just system of equality and equity uh, of justice. Uh, so here he is telling uh, the world, he said, we of the Conference of the Nationalist Organization of the Portuguese Colonies. Amilcar Cabral was able to unite the nationalist movement in Angola, Mozambique, and Guinea-Bissau, and San Tome and Principe into a unified front against colonialism. And he is the face and the, uh, the ears uh, of this uh, organization. He is the mouth the f and, and the face of this organization. So he says, we in the conference of the nationalist organizations of the Portuguese colonies are fighting for the complete liberation of our peoples. Uh, but we are not fighting simply in order to hoist a flag in our countries and to have a national anthem. We are fighting so that insults may, not, may no longer uh, rule in our countries, so that our peoples may never more be exploited. And the exploitation is not just the white uh, exploiter, it is also the black exploiter. This is very pertinent for contemporary Africa, because in some countries, after independence, the situation got so bad that people were saying, when will independence come? And some were even saying, well, it was better when uh, the French were here, when the Portuguese were here. Right. That's how bad things have got. And this is a warning about that. Right. I think that Brown was very fond of children. Right. He called them the flowers of the revolution. Uh, Again, this is it's not only his humanistic side, right? he was a humanist, but of course a great visionary that, unlike other leaders in Africa, that see power just in terms of um, their own satisfaction, this is a guy who is preparing the future of the country. So paying attention to children, they are uh, the future. Um, the war in 
Portuguese Guinea was particularly brutal. Portuguese Guinea was called Portugal's Vietnam. In that way, this was also happening when the United States was, was in Vietnam. And the close relationship between the United States and Portugal, Portugal is under the umbrella of the United States in the context of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Um, and so it is also following very cl closely, Portugal is following very closely uh, the war in Vietnam. The war in Vietnam par parallels the liberation wars in Africa, the wars, of Indi the wars for independence in Africa. The Portuguese actually imitate the American strategy in Vietnam. They are dropping things like NATO on innocent people. They have the whole villagization um, strategy. And um, finally, the Portuguese uh, would copy the United States strategy of the Vietnamization, which makes it the Vietnamization of the war, which is like um, getting the Vietnamese people to, to carry the burden of the war. The Portuguese will start the Africanization of the war by recruiting uh, more and more Africans. Uh, it's a bloody war. Uh, and it takes a toll. It has a toll on uh, the Portuguese people. Uh, the draft uh, is a big issue. Young Portuguese people are drafted into these wars um, in three fronts. It's in Guinea-Bissau, it's in Angola, uh, and it's in, it, it is in Mozambique. And they are dying uh, for, a, for, a, for a regime that also oppresses them um, in, um, in Portugal. The, the fascist re regime is a brutal regime. Um, freedom of speech uh, is curtailed. Uh, freedom of movement is curtailed. Uh, and so, um, like any other dictatorship, uh, rights, basic fundamental rights, are also um, uh, restricted. So, uh, Guinea-Bissau is uh, Portugal's uh, uh, Vietnam. Uh, the Portuguese high command actually starts off by um, underestimating the determination of the, uh, these fighters for independence. Uh, I have a quotation in the book in which uh, a very famous general, General Caunsa de Ariaga, excuse my pronunciation of these, Portuguese. Some of these um, Portuguese officers are uh, imbued with strong white supremacist ideas. And he is one of those. Uh, he says here, he says, subversion is a war um, above all of intelligence. Subversion is a war above all of intelligence. One must be highly intelligent to carry out, to carry on subversion. Not everyone can do it. Now, the black people are not highly intelligent. On the contrary, they are the least intelligent of all peoples in the world. So when you have Portuguese soldiers with that kind of mentality, um, it becomes a rude shock. Uh, and, and Cabral was a rude shock. Cabral would outmaneuver uh, the Portuguese in, uh, in, in the war in Guinea-Bissau. The war in Guinea-Bissau was the most effective. If Portugal was defeated in her colonial war, it was in Guinea-Bissau where she was defeated, and particularly after the death of Amilcar Cabral, when the liberation movement would acquire the latest uh, high-tech uh, weapons, which is the surface to air. The Portuguese military didn't even have it. And so that would end the war in favor of the, um, uh, of the, um, of Amilcar Cabral's uh, uh, army. Right, um, Amilcar Cabral, at the, at the same time that he was busy conducting a war, at the same time that he was busy, you know, crisscrossing continents and countries, and trying to mobilize uh, resources for the, uh, for the war effort, he was also 
uh, in solidarity, he was expressing solidarity with what he called all just cause. Uh, when the Watts riots erupted in the United States, he made a statement. He said, uh, we in the conference um, that I mentioned, the conference uh, uh, of the nationalist organization of the Portuguese countries, he says, we are fairly in solidarity with every just cause. He would not only support the Palestinians, but all the other um, movements around the world. He says, we are with the blacks of North Africa. America. This was, of course, in the context of the Civil War here in North America. We are with them in the streets of Los Angeles. This is the Watts riots. This is happening soon after the Watts riots in North of Los Angeles. And he says, when they are deprived of all possibility of life, we suffer with them. Now, that was a very brave thing to say because, again, to say that against the United States, not many African um, uh, leaders were you know, uh, brave enough to criticize the staff in the United States at the time. Right? But it's uh, just the strength of his conviction. Uh, the war um, in, uh, in Guinea-Bissau, because it was, uh, Cabral insisted on a clean war. Right? And he, in, he insisted with his soldiers not to torture prisoners of war, you know, that they were to be treated, as I said, uh, well, and um, uh, some ultimately would be sent home through the uh, International Red Cross. Um, and the Portuguese themselves also uh, uh, made this clear. The Portuguese tell us that much of the atrocities that was done during this war was actually carried out by the Portuguese themselves. They admitted that. Um, and so what became the uh, armed forces uh, movement that would end uh, 48 years of dictatorship in, uh, in Portugal was actually uh, cooked up in Guinea-Bissau. Right? Uh, it was the soldiers in Guinea-Bissau, because they were having much more of a harder time in Guinea-Bissau than they were having in Angola or Mozambique. They became war fatigued. They were tired of the war. And, um, this is a statement of their position with regards to the war. It says, we Portuguese military troops who were sent to a war that we did not understand or support have in our hands a unique opportunity to repair the crimes of fascism and colonialism, to set up the basis for a new fraternal cooperation between the peoples of Portugal and, and Guinea Bissau. It was this organization the Armed Forces uh, Movement of Guinea that would return to Portugal uh, and mobilize more soldiers and topple the Estado Novo, the dictatorship. So here is the irony, um, in that a war uh, to suppress the freedoms of the people uh, in Africa would end up liberating the people in Portugal, all right? And again, this has a lot to do with Cabral, with his whole, uh, his ability to separate, to identify the real enemy, that it is not the Portuguese people. And so Cabral had a lot of supporters uh, in Portugal itself. You know, the soldiers began to listen to his mess message, you know, and they became empathetic to the liberation struggle in these colonies. Finally, the long war would come to an end. Uh, before it comes to an end, uh, on um, uh, 20th of January, 1973, Amilcar Cabral is assassinated. And he is killed by one of his trusted uh, lieutenants. Disgruntled because he was disciplined, uh, he didn't like it, and of course he also fed into the uh, the Portuguese colonial uh, authorities in Guinea-Bissau were exploiting uh, this 
uh, antagonism between the native people of Guinea-Bissau and the Cape Verdean. The relatively privileged position of Cape Verdeans in Guinea-Bissau as colonial officials. The, um, the strong feelings that the native people have of these colonial uh, officials. That was now exploited by the authorities. By the authorities would now reverse. Uh, General Spinola, who is the governor uh, that was sent to Portuguese Guinea uh, to, to just save Portugal. He would use tactics of divide and conquer by, uh, first of all, coming out with a policy, of, a policy called Guinea Milior, Better Guinea. And that would involve uh, dismissing all the Cape Verdean officials in the administration, appointing native Guineans, but also uh, launching a propaganda that the Cape Verdeans were the enemies of the Guinea-Bissau people. All right. um, and so uh, this gruntle, unhappy uh, Guineans would also feed, feed into that, and that was part of the reason um, that led to the assassination of uh, Amilcar Cabral. Of course, the Portuguese are complicit in this, um, in this assassination. They had tried to kill him several times. You know. In 1970, they invaded Conakry, uh, and the uh, mission was to kill Amilcar Cabral and the uh, president of Guinea Conakry, Sekou Toure. Uh, unfortunately, Portuguese intelligence was not very good. Amilcar Cabral was out of the country. So those many <laughs> travels that he was in actually saved him. You know, they bombed his house uh, where he lived and destroyed uh, uh, the police, uh, but um, they didn't get him. So that was evidence of the fact that they wanted to kill him. Now, the death of Cabral, uh, it provoked a storm of criticism against Portugal, you know. And surprisingly, the criticism came from Portugal's allies, countries allied to Portugal in NATO countries like Great Britain and the United States. So we get, uh, for example, the London Times would describe the murdered Cabral as, quote, one of the most extraordinary leaders and thinkers of modern Africa. The New York Times would um, characterize him, would consider him, quote, one of the most prominent leaders of the African struggle against white supremacy. So killing Cabral, the Portuguese thought they would kill the struggle, but actually they made it worse for themselves because Cabral's fighters became even more determined. Uh, countries like Russia, but well, Russia was a little reluctant, was always reluctant. Cabral had asked Russia for more, for better weapons, including the surface-to-air missile. And the Russians said, no, we don't. they didn't anyway. All right, uh, because I guess in the context of the Cold War, they didn't want to upset how they were concerned about how the United States would see that. Uh, but after Cabral was killed, uh, the movement, the PAIGC, were able to get this surface to air missile. And they, in just one month, they paralyzed the Portuguese Air Force. The Portuguese had advantage of air superiority, they were bombing without any uh, problem. They would just move from one area to the other. That was the biggest problem that the PIGC had. Uh, they didn't have air power. The Portuguese had exclusive control of the skies. But with the surface-to-air missiles, they were able to down planes one after the other and paralyze the air force. And that was it. The Portuguese were in their isolated you know, garrisons um, without supply. And it, it just ended. That was, that was the end of the war. Cabral is gone, uh, so Guinea-Bissau, in six, nine months after the death of Cabral, Guinea-Bissau unilaterally declared independence. So Guinea-Bissau was the first country to declare independence, 24th September 1973. That would be followed by Mozambique uh, in, uh, in, in June, then Cape Verde in July, and uh, it's like a domino effect, San Tome and Principe in uh, July, and finally Angola, which is uh, very contested uh, decolonization. 
Angola was going to spend another 27 years fighting each other. And the three liberation movements that were fighting against the Portuguese, as soon as the Portuguese leave, they will turn on each other. And for 27 years, they will devastate this beautiful country. Uh, so uh, these countries have independence. Independence has come. Um, and I conclude the biography uh, with an examination by looking at the lessons uh, of Cabral. Uh, the importance of Cabral in the wider context of Africa and the world. Uh, Cabral himself is memorialized uh, in statues and, and uh, the names of streets and parks and avenues. Uh, not only in Guinea-Bissau, uh, but also in other countries, <laughs> including Europe. In France, there's a, there's a street in Paris, there's a street named after Amilcar Cabral. Um, but also uh, bridges and airport, the international airport in Cape Verde, uh, on the island of Sao, is named after Amilcar Cabral. So, um, I want to conclude by saying, uh, by emphasizing some of the most important aspect of this uh, of Amilcar Cabral and of this study of Amilcar. <coughs> First of all, it is the importance of Amilcar Cabral as a 20th century world leader. He was a very important um, African leader. Uh, some people have called him the Che Guevara of um, of Africa, but I think he was more than he did more than Che Guevara because Amilcar Cabral insisted on the specificity of situations. He was against the importation of revolution. He said, what we do, it has to, we have to take into account our reality. All right? We can't just import what the Cubans did, for example. Right? And he was very close to Fidel Castro. Um, the Cubans played a very important role in Guinea-Bissau. They were actively engaged in South. But Amilcar Cabral was always uh, in charge you know, of, of, uh, of all the operations. So uh, the liberation struggle that he conducted uh, was consequential. Uh, not only did it bring independence to Guinea-Bissau and Cape Verde and helped to bring independence to the other colonies, but also to Portugal. It helped to end um, dictatorship in Portugal and reintroduce democracy in Portugal. And that's a very important aspect. The other important thing to note about Cabral is that he was an original thinker. He reinterpreted Marxism um, and contextualized uh, you know, Marxism. He wrote about um, liberation movement, African history, social formation. He was an intellectual by every name. It comparable to people like Franz Fanon, you know, Mao Zedong. He was one of very few Africans to actually write. Many Africans don't write anything. They just enjoy the power and that's it. Um, the third point is the importance of Amilcar Cabral as a humanist. He was a humanist and an internationalist. He was empathetic, he showed solidarity, and he's always about social justice. So he is relevant for today. He's not only in the past, his ideas still resonate in Africa. And Amilcar Cabral uh, is important, particularly for people of all colors, not just for Africans, people of all colors around the world who are burdened, who have to struggle daily against poverty, against exploitation, oppression, humiliation. So Amelka Cabral uh, continues to be relevant to the contemporary world. And as I said, if you're Cape Verdean, uh, if you're uh, Bissau Guinean, if you're African, he's a source of pride and a source of inspiration. Thank you very much. So this is the book, we have it back there for sale. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have the 
the means for credit card. Uh, so it's cash only. It costs fourteen ninety five, but we'll just we'll drop the ninety five and, and just take fourteen dollars. All right. And I'll sign the books uh, if you want me to sign them. And um, a few minutes for question and answer. I'm sure there's many, many questions we all have. And I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did when I first heard about it at Rhode Island College. So any questions for the professor before we? Yes. Ma'am, go right ahead. Oh, perhaps, I, perhaps I missed it. Oh. What, <clears throat> what country supported them with war material? Cuba? Right, Cuba was definitely one of them. It was, was one of the most important ones. Um, again, as I said, the background here is the Cold War. The Cold War was important for Africans fighting for their freedom because um, it gave them uh, a choice, okay? Particularly those that actually picked up arms to fight. Because uh, if you turn, if you are a Portuguese colony and you have to fight against your Portuguese colonizer, these, uh, these, liber these organizations, they don't have weapons. You gotta get them somewhere, from somewhere, all right? So say you turn to the French and you say, well, help us uh, with weapons, we're fighting against the Portuguese. The French will say, no, 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 the Portuguese are our allies. The British will tell you the same thing, the, the Italians will tell you the same thing. So what's the only choice you have? This is a bipolar world of East and West, the West, you will not get any weapons from, so you turn to the East. What is the East? The Soviet Union, okay? And uh, Soviet, uh, the other Eastern, uh, Eastern Bloc countries, Bulgaria, uh, Yugoslavia, um, uh, Hungary, uh, Czechoslovakia, and also uh, Asian countries like the People's Republic of China. So the People's Republic of China, in fact, uh, was the first country to give support to give support to America Cabral. His first group of fighters were trained at the military academy in Nanjing. Yeah. So the, the, the China was important, uh, but perhaps much more important was Cuba, because the Cubans not only uh, supply materials. This is a very little known fact, uh, because at the time. It was kept secret. The Cubans actually fought in Guinea Bissau. But under the, they fought in Guinea Bissau. They were fighting in Guinea Bissau. But they were fighting on the Amilcar Cabral. And in, in the book, I, I you know talk about their frustration because they would tell Cabral, "This is what should be done." And Cabral would say, "Well, I'll, I'll let you know." All right. And Cabral it was the one who was totally in charge. Cabral and his war and his war council. Yes, so they would, they, those are the countries that have. But uh, let me also add, uh, so there was uh, war material that they needed, which they got from mainly from the communist countries. But there was also what was called humanitarian uh, uh, support, which they got from countries like Sweden and, and Denmark, mainly the Scandinavian countries. Right? So they would get food items, clothing, uh, and things like that. Those are called humanitarian. Yes? Yes, ma'am. I'm thinking about your comment. Uh, post revolution, uh, some people may have felt, as you said, it was better with the French. What, what are some of the factors that, that make the democratic institutions so difficult to acknowledge after a revolution? And I'm thinking particularly about uh, Cape Verde. Right. Just in well, Cape Verde, Cape Verde actually um, turned out much better. Uh, it started off uh, with a rigid, rigid, rigid um, one-party system, and in 1991, that changed. It's now uh, one of the vibrant uh, uh, multi-party systems in Africa. It's doing very well uh, in terms of governance. In fact, uh, its president got an award. Uh, it's called the Moore Abraham Award. Uh, Mo Abraham is a very rich uh, African, I think he's of Sudanese background, that uh, has, he has a prize, I think it's $5 million for the best African uh, leader. That's more than the Nobel Prize. Uh, for the best African leader. Now that leader uh, has to demonstrate good leadership. And Pedro Pires, 
of Cape Verde has won it. Won it. I think it was the last win. But so far, I think just a handful of people that have won it. So to answer your question, it has to do with the fact that soon after independence, these are those Africans that came into power, they became intoxicated with power. And dictatorships um, sprang all over the place. We want, I, I should add that Africans, the, during the colonial period, they didn't know dictatorship. So it was a learning um, thing for them. What they inherited after independence was a very uh, dictatorial uh, machinery. All right? And the challenge for them was to uh, democratize this, uh, this uh, uh, machinery. And, and some of them failed miserably. So we had some brutal dictatorships in Africa. It is Idi Amin in, uh, in <coughs> Uganda. It is uh, uh, the guy in the, in the Congo, uh, Mobutu in the Congo. So dictators, dictators were all over the place. <coughs> yes, we, we spoke briefly before the presentation about the two government that we have governments in guinea bissau now after the last election. What are your thoughts about the potential for civil war? Here? Well, it's, it's, it's very high. It's very high. guinea bissau unfortunately, is one of those countries that has been conflict afflicted for quite a while. You know, um, it came out of independence um, with a lot of goodwill around the world because, again, of this, of the legacy of Cabral. Um, and then in 1980, the first uh, coup d'etat took place. And since then, it's just it's been going downhill. Um, so uh, elections are violently contested all over Africa. If you remember in Kenya, uh, I think the, elect the elections they had in 2010 or something like that, 1,000 people were killed. It got better the last election because only 100 people were killed. But people are, people, people are often the casualties of these elections. Guinea Bissau, um, the elections themselves do not end in violence, but it is the argument uh, amongst the, the lead. Nobody loses, by the way. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> has to be the winner. And this time around, it has been very, very contentious. Uh, and so recently, um, uh, one of the losers had, uh, one of the uh, contenders declared that he won, and he, the other one said, no, you didn't, there's fraud. And so uh, before the Supreme Court could give final verdict, uh, he went out and declared himself president. Meanwhile, the head of the uh, National Assembly, who is like the second in succession, uh, because we don't, they don't have a vice president. Uh, so he has now been declared uh, the president. So now we have a situation of two presidents. And a new prime minister has been uh, uh, appointed. So two presidents and two prime ministers. And if that is not a, a, a recipe for uh, an explosive uh, situation, I don't know what it is. So, People from Guinea Bissau are holding their breath right now and just praying that it doesn't explode into violence. But all the indications are to find out end well. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, I just want to thank you for such an interesting and inspiring lecture and so beautifully presented it. I just wanted to say I think it would make a great movie. Oh. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. <laughs> Maybe I should talk to someone. I should talk to someone in Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's been Africa. Is, things are very dramatic. Things are happening. But this story of Amilcar Cabral actually, um, it's a film in making. I do know again it's our filmmaker who is preparing that. Yes. There's also a Cape Verdean filmmaker who has done a short uh, film, Guinea uh, Pius. Yes, he did a, a short film about him. In um, Santo Mei, Prince of Hay. Right. No, no. But that, that was about the plantation, yeah, the cocoa plantation. But he has actually worked, he has 
he had worked on a film about a biography of uh, Linda Carlisle, a biography. Yes? Is there any way to get a copy of that film? Uh, there's a website that you can get. Which one? Uh, the short film. The short film about Kate Bird? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think it's online. The, the, the filmmaker's name is Guinea, G U E N N Y, Pyrrhus. Pyrrhus. You might find it, if you Google it, you might find it, find it online. I'm not sure if the he film has been released. Yeah, I believe yeah. he is. Yeah, okay. Because he's even visited down here. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I know him personally yeah. because he interviewed me for his film on Santo Mier and Prince Edward yeah. on the plantations. Yeah. So, in Rhode Island College, I want, well, I mean, in Washington, but I want, I specifically want you to say, was it your brother or one of the folks that were there for your, your book introduction? They said um, Cabral's daughter, was it correct me, went to Nelson Mandela? Oh, no, actually, that's in the book. Ah, okay. No, that's in the that book. Um, huh? Yeah, I mentioned it briefly. Uh, it was Cabral's sister-in-law. 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 When uh, Nelson Mandela was released, Cabral's sister-in-law met him, and she was full of admiration for Nelson Mandela, like everybody. So she said to him, you are the greatest. And Mandela quickly turned around and said, no, there is Cabral. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. See, even Nelson Mandela, when he, when he was in prison, he was reading about what Cabral was doing. So Cabral was inspirational. Yes. How many years in your studies did it take you to gather this information? Yeah. Um, well, I have been working on Guinea-Bissau. My dissertation was in, on Guinea-Bissau, the Portuguese um, colonial um, presence in Guinea-Bissau. And I have been following it up. But this book, it took me about two years to write. It was just um, gathering a lot of information here and there, but also interviewing um, liberation veterans of the liberal of the war in the Yeah. Uh, there's been a lot of there's a lot of book on Camille de Cabral. A lot of books have been written about Camille de Cabral. Lots and lots. In all in everywhere. Right now as we talk people are writing PhD dissertations on Camille de Cabral. Master's dissertations on Camille de Cabral. Like oh you'll find a lot of things. Yeah if it's if it's published here it would be in the Library of Congress, I guess. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is it not true that he came and you met with um, Malcolm X and... Uh, Cabral, I'm not sure if he met with uh, Malcolm X, but he did meet with people like Eldridge Cleaver. You remember him? This is the yeah. Black Panther guy who was in um, Algeria and Cabral frequented Algeria. Cabral mm -hmm. obviously met with um, another um, Black Panther guy who was in Guinea Conakry. He would later change his name to um, Kwame Toure is, uh, is what was that? Carmichael. Carmichael, yes, Carmichael. Still think, still think Carmichael. Yes, yes, Cabral met him in, uh, because Cabral was living in Conakry. So, yes. Yeah. But um, I haven't seen anywhere that he has met uh, uh, Malcolm X. Don't forget Malcolm X was assassinated in 65. Was assassinated yeah. So Cabral started to come to the United States uh, more frequently after that. Yeah. Um, the stamp that Cuba has for him. The history professor at um, White High School, when I go there, when I'm going there every year to study, he was fascinated with that, that, that um, Cuba actually. Oh, the Cubans love Camilo. Because in 1966, when they had the tricontinental uh, meeting of uh, leaders of liberation movement, third world movements, they met in uh, Havana in 1966. And Cabral made a speech, and uh, Castro was blown out. He was fascinating. In fact, uh, until then, the Cubans were very reluctant <coughs> to help. Uh, uh, to be involved. But soon after that, um, they poured everything in. And Cabral also met um, Che Guevara. In fact, it was Che Guevara that um, 
told Castro that, hey, Che Guevara was in uh, his country. As you know, um, he was in the Congo. It was a very disastrous adventure. He went to the Democratic Republic of the Congo after the assassination of Lumumba to help the people that were uh, his supporters to fight against uh, Mobutu. But it turned out very disastrously, and he left um, in disgust. And that was when he decided to go, because he believed in export of revolution. That's when he decided to go to South America. And of course, Bolivia was a disaster where he was finally killed. And I thought I saw that he used to wear a t-shirt, Colombia University? Did he come to Colombia University? Cover up. He might have um, uh, made a speech there, but I'm not aware, um, aware of it. Yeah. He, he did make a, a, a presentation to Congress. Yes. Uh, and I document that in the book, had a lot of supporters, and in fact, when he was killed in the African American community, um, was devastated. Yeah. He, uh, there was a gathering in New York of uh, over 50 African American organizations that he addressed in New York, um, just before, like a, a year before his death. So he was a frequent visitor to the United Nations. Um, but also, oh, and he made a, a very brilliant speech at Syracuse University in New York. One thing I should have said about Cabral, uh, about Cape Verde, um, which was inspirational for uh, Cabral, when Cabral moved as an eight year old from Guinea Bissau to, um, to Cape Verde, uh, he became very much inspired by the oral history that he was hearing about the resistance of Cape Verdeans. Cape Verdeans uh, were, were resilient people that they had been through very tough times. Those 500 years of the Portuguese, uh, it was tough. You know, the slave-based society, the enslaved people were tra treated horribly. The environment was not very good. Um, the soil erosion, so there were regular droughts and famines. The famines, thousands of people would die. And, and that was what spurred the migration as well and created this uh, diaspora that you have here in the, in the United States. I know about the whaling, the story of the whaling. But really, it's, it's about um, uh, the dire conditions uh, in Cape Verde. So resistance, uh, what the thing that inspired Cabral was also the stories of resistance he was hearing. You, know, um, you have uh, peasant uprisings, uh, particularly Santiago was like the epicenter of these uh, resistance movements. You know. And there's a, I think it was 1910, there was a, a resistance at Rivera Manuel in Santa Catarina, it was led by a woman. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Anna Bumbulon, that's all. And she rallied, you know, people to uh, uh, to fight against the landowners. One of them absentee landowners, but the land tenure was, uh, was a big problem there. And so uh, they, would, they kept on increasing the land rents, particularly in times of famine. And so um, there were regular uprisings. So again, that strong spirit of resistance uh, was what, what, what kept Cabral, what inspired Cabral as well. Yes. Just a comment to, to follow up for those that are interested in a novel about that resiliency. Mm -hmm. uh, Balazar Lopes's exactly. uh, Chiquino yeah. was just this past year um, translated into English for the first time by yes. the University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth, the uh, Center for Portuguese Studies and Culture, and uh, Re Representative uh, Fernandez, myself, and the Senator Dean Cito have contributed three copies to the CLAM system through this library and the other two found the system. So if you haven't read Chiquino, uh, it's available here at the library. Yeah. Is it available to purchase? Uh, it's also available to purchase, yeah, through uh, UMass if you go online to their, the Tajus Press, Tajus, uh, like the river that... Because I'm thinking of the museum in the future, the... the, the yes, we do have, we have, one. Yeah. We have one. We have, yes, in, in both Wesley and Wayne have, have purchased them, and that's why we not only said just museum, Cape Verdean Museum, which is wonderful for the 
the, like you said, the whaling industry and the yeah. cranberries mm -hmm. and all that than when we got here, but cultural center was added on specifically so that we could have um, a collection of books and art and artifacts and magazines um, of all of its history mm -hmm. and teach the youth. I agree with Cabral 100%. Actually, you know what? Cabral was born exactly on my father's birthday. Wow. The same day, the same September, year. September 12th. September 12th. 1924. That was my father's birthday. So anymore, so I don't, so look, Cabral born there, my father born here. And that's why I've, I've said earlier about the uh, unfortunate circumstances of the the rich and the poor and the light-skinned and dark-skinned and the Portuguese and the American because my father um, has five brothers in East Boston and um, they were relatively well-to-do. My, my grandfather, I hear, had his own restaurant and you know rooming house mm -hmm. East Boston and he was the youngest of the children and the brothers all were very light-skinned. Mm -hmm. Two of them went into the Navy, and I heard that they actually lighter skinned than lighter skinned. They could get a, a promotion, mm -hmm. but they would have to say the other one didn't know the other one and not a whole to get the promotion. <laughs> right there on the same ship in the same Navy. And my father was a little more my complexion and could not pass and had a, a difficult time with that all his life. And I thought, when I finally found out about Cabral at Rhode Island College or in 95, when I met uh, Charlie Coli, my other sister friend, and Dr. Richard Loban and Carolyn, I first realized that they were born on the same day. And I said, here and there, what a difference it would have been maybe if either my father was born where Cabral was or yeah. Cabral was born where yeah. the, Not the tale of two cities, but the tale of two Cape Verde cities. Right. Right. You know? right. So any other questions for Dr. Peter Mendy? And we're going to have him sign the book. No, Oh. Finishing up the talks so with oh, okay. Good yeah. idea. Yeah. No, I was going to quote this uh, the woman resistor that I mentioned, Nya Anna Bombolong. I have a document here. Uh, so it, it, it's in Creole. She says, This is a, a rallying call for revolts. She says, Omi, Faka, Mujer, Mujer. Machado, Mozinus Tudu Taf Junta Pedra, which means men, knives, women, machetes, all children gather stones. So those were the weapons that they had to fight against, you know, uh, the colonial police. The landlords called the colonial police and they came to brutalize them. And uh, obviously they were overwhelmed and they were all arrested, uh, beaten up, tied and then paraded around the island as a set an example. So here in, in one Cape Cod directly, many folks know about Eugenia Force. So you're talking about a woman, and here we go, stepping right off into Women's History Month next month. And um, Eugenia Force came from Cape Verde as a young girl to Cape Cod. And I think you know of her. You've right. met her probably right. before. So. Um, she, long, longer story than we have to hear, but she was um, walking on the beach in Hyannis after she had been working, cleaning houses and down south and back again for a wealthy family. And it was near the Kennedy compound where she was, where she was a domestic. And the police actually said for her to get off that property. She was with another friend who was Darker skin, mm -hmm. an African American woman, and the police said there, there's no blacks allowed on this beach. Mm -hmm. And Eugenia, in you know, in the 40s, or whatever, was having none of it. Um, this is my beach. I grew up here as well. This is my country, isn't it? So she co-founded the NAACP, and she lived. And I, I finally got to be able to interview her. So that's why I'm so 
encouraged with all of this that you folks are doing, and I love it when you also include women, because I, I befriended Crispina Gomes, Dr. Crispina Gomes, over in, in Cape Verde in 97 when I first went over there as a summer seminar abroad student with the URI RIC program, and Crispina and some of the wonderful women over there that I met right. talked, um, uh, Dr. Vera Dwarf, and they talked about no Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We fought along with the men, she said, and they told me about dressing up in the fatigues and they would bound them so that they wouldn't look like women mm -hmm. yeah. and they would hold guns and they were right there and proudly beside their men and I thought, this is wonderful. As when I went there in 97, then I said, okay, Bird is more pro progressive than America. Women are, have more equal, you know, equal footing and they had a lot of women in power and very, very... Well, because, because, because it, it went through a revolution. Um, and women, to this day, are holding very important positions in government. Um, not only in Cape Verde, but in Guinea Bissau as well. And this last government, for the first time, uh, the first time in Africa as well, it had parity in the government. 50% of the ministers were women. You didn't have that anywhere in Africa. Mm -hmm. 